So uh, I thought this time I do a little bit something different because I was looking at my my uh, things that I did. This is 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. I did this family research. 41 years actually, 41. When I did my training with Virginia Satir in Weinheim, we had to prepare for our biography seminar, we had to prepare family history. And so I, we had about a year time to do that. And so it was very, very detailed and everything. So what I did, it was 1981, 1982. My mother had just died in 1979 and I had been sick with tuberculosis for a year. And after I came out of the sanatorium, I decided I wanted to do something for myself because I had lived a very, very exploitative lifestyle. I had worked like crazy. Uh, I had basically very, very unhappy relationships. And I fell ill with tuberculosis and nobody knew why and how that happened. It was never found out where I got infected. So uh, during that time in the sanatorium, I decided that I want to do more training and I want to go into individual personal therapy. So I, I joined this training in Weinheim, the Virginia Satir Systemic Family Therapy Training. And part of the training, big part of the training, was family research. Now by that time, I had no idea about my father's past. Nothing. I didn't know he was a Nazi. It was all silence. My father was still living. And of course I wanted to interview, we had to interview relatives. And I wanted to interview him. But my father, the way he was, he was very clear, yes, you can interview me, but only when you move in with me into my house and sleep in your mother's bed, meaning in his bed. I mean, this was, this was the end of our relationship. Of course, I didn't do that. So I had to travel around and interview other relatives, aunts and uncles, and um, to find out about my family. Not many people were willing to talk. It was very interesting. So whatever I found, I put in this folder. And at that time, there was no computer, nothing. So everything I did, this is a, this is a Niemeyer family story. Whatever I did, I had to do by hand. So I was going through all the old photo albums. And you have to see this. This is how I started. My father, my mother on their engagement. And you can look at it later when, when we're finished. I leave it here, you can go through it, you can take everything out, but please put it back in the same place. Mm -hmm. So but my father and my mother, and this was my father and my mother before the war in 1941, I think, yeah, 1941, at their engagement. In the same year, as I found out later, my father entered the Nazi party, but I didn't know that. And this is the last photo, one of the last photos I had with them together when I was living in Hamburg. And my father, when you look at two photos, you see the differences between the faces, both in my father and my mother. My father was a very, very lively man. He was the youngest of eight children. And when my grandmother was pregnant with him, his father died in a training camp in Berlin, Schöneberg, 1917, I think. No, 16, yeah, uh, from diabetes, 
So his mother had him as the youngest child, she had already seven, uh, and he grew up without a father. However, this photo that you see after the war, this was 19, I can't read it, 79 or something, before my mother died. And whenever I look at these photos, and I haven't looked at these photos in many years, uh, this, this folder is standing in my shelf at home, and I never touch it. Because it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite painful, partly. So he was an alcoholic. He was totally unpredictable, heavily violent. And my ma mother was very depressed. Mm -hmm. And depressed in a way she never, she never cried in front of us. She never, she was always smiling like this. And this was always a fake smile. She, she was not happy. So anyway, she died in 1979 from a aneurysma in the brain. And these photos are some of the last ones taken in her garden, which was one of her favorite places. And this was, no, I don't remember. So um, when, when I decided to go into this uh, training, uh, it was very painful because when my mother died so unexpectedly, she, she fell down in the garden with this aneurysma and then we still brought her to the hospital. She, was, uh, she had a surgery, but then she died a couple of days later. And she, uh, we visited her and the last thing she said to me before she died was take care of your siblings. And all my siblings were grown ups. My youngest sister had just moved out of the house a half year before she died. So naturally, I was furious when she said that. Because I, I had finally managed to leave that, that really cruel and, and violent house where I grew up in and have kind of freed myself from that. And then she puts this burden on me. I was really angry. And the following night she died. So, um, and I couldn't cry. I, when she died, I, I don't remember that I cried. I was more or less numb. And I think the fact that I got tuberculosis was a way of mourning. Because, it, I mean, tuberculosis is, is, is you cough and you can't really breathe. And it's really, really, it was really painful. So, so all my pain went into that disease. And, well, after I came out of the sanatorium, I, um, as I said, I decided to change my life. I decided to go to, to therapy and to do this, this uh, training. And of course, uh, I was very much confronted with my family. Because we, of course, systemic therapy is all about this family therapy. So we did a lot of sculptures and working on the family structure, and especially this one. We also had to, <clears throat> as part of the preparation for this biography seminar, we had to write um, the life story of each of our parents as if I was that parent. So I wrote a life story about my father as if I was my father and for my mother as if I was my mother. And I remember that this was really painful. And I think, I don't know when it was that I read it again and I read it and I thought, wow, I was quite detached at that time. I was not really feeling much. I was more trying to cope with situations and trying to function uh, instead of feeling. And I, I understand now that um, not feeling helps survive sometimes. It's just survival mechanisms. Um, because, and then when, when my father committed suicide, which was 1985, it was even worse 
I was completely let down. I didn't feel anything. And I remember Irv asking me one day, because we talk about these things right in this book together, we talk about these things, and he said, what did you feel? I said, I felt nothing. If anything, I felt relief that I didn't, did not have to meet him again, ever. But this was so burdened with shame. How can you say something about your father like that? It was the first time when I talked with Irv about a couple of months ago that I could say that sentence and feel it, that I was relieved when my father died. And I also was relieved when my mother died, if I'm really honest. Because my parents weren't parents that were approving of who I was. <clears throat> I grew up with a lot of violence and abuse, sexually, emotionally, physically, a lot of pain, a lot of not being cared for. And, but on the other hand, you're supposed to love your parents. So I was living in this contradictory uh, situation, emotional situation, having been treated terribly, but on the other hand, you have to love your parents. And the interesting thing was when I started with the with family constellation, with Helling, working with Hellinger, uh, now talking about it, I also realized that there is also a lot of pressure there in that scene. You have to honor your parents. It's a very religious um, thinking. You have to honor your parents, not any not in order to get to heaven, but in order to have a good life. Or the whole concept of forgiveness, which I'm completely against. But it's like as if there is a unspoken rule that in order to live a have, have happy life, you have to love your parents or honor your parents. And this, I think, is such a heavy burden for children who have been heavily abused. It's, how can I love my parents who mistreated me? What I can do, and this, this is what I have come to up to, until now, is I am very, very grateful that, we, that they gave me life. Tremendously grateful. Because I, I really love to live. I love my life, I love what I'm creating, I love, I love to have a body, to have a, and to do what I want to do, to have freedom to do what I want to do, to live in a country that allows me to be who I want to be. So I'm very grateful that they gave me life, especially under the aspect that it wasn't really easy for them. My mother lost her first child an hour after birth. And she was pregnant with me right after that. And she was also uh, all the time in danger to lose me. So she was lying in bed most of the time during pregnancy and the birth was extremely heavy. So I don't think that she really wanted me. I don't think so. I don't, anyway, I think she didn't want children, but being Catholic, there was no choice. She even said that several times, that she had no choice. So, uh, all, under all those aspects, uh, I'm very grateful for that. But do I love my parents? No. And it's, it's really daring to say these things because, uh, Many, many people would say, well, she's really not finished with her childhood. No, but I think no one can be finished with their ch childhood, ever. As, especially when you, when, you, when you are growing up in a, in, a, in a house, in a family that is not very child friendly. We have, we grew up with, with the saying that you have to break a child's 
platform. That was the general rule. You have to break them as soon as possible. They don't, they are not allowed to have their own will. So, um, when I look at myself in my life, how I am now and where I am now, uh, and that I'm with a partner <laughs> who is a combination of a loving father and a loving partner and a, and a co-worker, co-writer. Well, I feel I'm blessed. So how can I not be grateful? I am grateful, tremendously grateful. But it doesn't mean that I love my parents. Uh, I think I never will. And uh, to say that, is both liberating and also a little bit, uh oh, can I really allow myself to say that? Is that okay to not love my parents? And another part of that is that I always had to choose uh, substitute families. So a big part of my life was dedicated, unconsciously dedicated, to find a home, find a family, find somewhere where I could say, this is my home. So at the same time, when I went into this training, and when I went into, into therapy, I also discovered the spiritual community of Osho. And I became a sannyasi. That's where my name comes from, Sakino. And I thought, wow, this is my home now. Those are different people. Those are the chosen people. Those are the ones who are, who are loving and everything. So I entered the commune and I lived in the commune for four years. Um, and I was happy. I really was happy. But I was happy in a way that I would now, looking back, I would say it was like a small child. I wasn't thinking much. I was just diving into the community and, and enjoying being taken care of and, and, and having a place um, where I, I could flourish in many, many ways, professionally, as a therapist, uh, as a person. The, the freedom of, of being sexually uh, open with anyone I wanted to be, all these things, it was wonderful. And then, in 1985, the whole thing blew up. The, the commune was located in Oregon, and uh, it just turned out that uh, so many criminal acts had been committed there. And so the whole thing blew up, and I was I was quite devastated because it was yeah destroying my child childlike innocent belief that all is good and it wasn't. And when I left the commune, I remember I was staying here at the Kuda with my little suitcase. I only had, my possession was one small suitcase with a few socks and, a, and I think a skirt and a few photos or something, nothing more. I had no money, none whatsoever. And no money means no money, not even a small coin in my pocket. So I was standing there and I thought, okay, my life could be finished now, but it wasn't. And I, that, was a, that was the time when I realized how strong I am, that I can survive any situation. So I found ways, I, in the first night, I, I thought, where, where, where am I going to sleep? And I remember there was a friend who worked in the disco at night, and we were good friends, so I went, in the evening, I went into the disco and asked him, can I sleep in your bed while you're on night shift? And of course he said yes. 
So I slept in his bed for a few nights until I found a place in a shared apartment. So from then on, I, I just rebuilt my life. And um, I was a traveling therapist at that time. So I got myself a car very quickly. Once I had a little bit of money, I bought a very, very old Citroen and traveled, traveled around. Wherever I got invited to work, I worked. And then I met my husband and again, I thought I, no, I didn't think I have found a home, but I was very much in love and, and we, we were good together for many years. This is another story, but uh, I never, I think I never felt back into that childlike, innocent belief system, oh, this is my home. But I, I think I was, I was still having this longing for it. And um, until I think when we got divorced, my husband, after two, 22 years, we got divorced for other reasons. I think we got divorced because I got involved with Dunbaron and the search for my father's Nazi past. That was in 2001. Uh, and I started researching. Uh, <coughs> and my, my ex-husband, he didn't want me to go there, and uh, but I still did. So that ended our relationship, basically. Um, that was again another path that I went on. And after we divorced, I built up a life for myself. And that was the first time in my life I lived by myself. For 14 years, I took care of myself financially and economically um, in my own apartment, and I really loved it. So for me, when I, when I allowed myself to open up for love again, with Earth, I, I was quite shocked that this happens. And I was very hesitant to give up. And I'm still, I'm not giving up my life here, but for me it was a different quality of um, allowing myself to commit because I know I have my own life and I have my own identity in myself. So it's not, it's not this very innocent childlike looking for a home or anything. And so I think probably that's why I uh, took this out of the shelf this morning, or even yesterday I thought taking this, um, because this was a turning point in my life when, when my mother died and I came out of this tuberculosis and started with this systemic um, training and systemic thinking. Um, That's it, I would say.